testers approach to testing both as a platform to work Kali is a major part of any pen testers approach to testing both as a platform to work from and a source of the nature of system vulnerabilities means that the pen tester is faced with a range of operating systems and applications and for each of them a variety of release levels technology changes quickly but can persist for a long time and technology users differ widely in their attention to applying patches and updates consequently running a pen test requires a lot of preparation to determine what might be the right tools and exploits to use and to manage the uncertainty that comes with using tools and exploits in an uncertain environment Offensive Security provides a training course known as Pen Testing with Carly, or PWK, which includes the OSCP professional examination for pen testers. This is the most widely recognized qualification in the pen testing world. PWK provides a training manual and videos to provide a basic level of understanding and a training lab in which to spend many hours attempting system penetrations in order to direct research and build experience, as well as learning the approaches to specific system penetrations. It's as much as anything an opportunity to develop an effective personal style. Pen testing is not about cooking up tests from a recipe book, which has the perfect solution for every target. Exploits are continually being developed, and the combination of configurations and software makes every target a unique challenge. Pen testing, therefore, is about understanding the target, being able to creatively identify potential weak spots, and then being able to craft a unique set of tests to suit the target. We can create labels such as script kiddies, cyber warriors, exploiters, and so on. But in fact, there are no preordained levels of a pen tester, just a continuum from beginner to expert. Everyone starts out knowing nothing, but depending upon the time and effort they invest in learning, they can become competent pen testers. As with any other endeavor, some people will have more aptitude and learn faster. But it's just about plain old learning and experience. There's no magic here. A novice pen tester will be able to run automated tools to find vulnerabilities and in some cases to automate the collection of penetration evidence. The challenge gets harder the more obscure the target software or the relevant exploit. At a more advanced level, exploits may exist but need to be customized to suit the target, and so a level of reverse engineering is required. At the expert level, the pen tester will carry out vulnerability research on his or her targets to find zero-day exploits and craft specific attacks. Anyone wanting to learn pen testing can become a competent advanced tester. The key learning in the Offensive Security PWK course is persistence. The course motto is try harder. Pen testers will need to have a broad range of skills across networks, operating systems, and common applications. Most testers will then focus their skills on something such as wireless networks, specific operating systems such as Windows or Linux, specific services such as web, or specific applications. Already there are some specialized areas such as SCADA systems, control systems used in it, such areas as power stations and other utilities. The explosion in technology that's occurring with the Internet of Things means there'll be many more specialized areas, home automation, transportation, and automotive, industrial automation, e-health devices, and so on. Developing as a pen tester also means developing your own approach to testing and learning how to manage the vast amount of pen testing knowledge that you acquire. Getting yourself ready to do pen testing by creating your own toolbox of useful tools and techniques is as much a part of training to be a pen tester as is learning about specific exploits. Carly supports the pen testing process by providing an effective pen testing environment right from the start, enabling quick wins and reproducible results. It's a generic toolbox straight off the shelf, and as a professional pen tester, you should be able to use Carly effectively while extending it to suit your own way of working. There are three main ways of using Carly as a hardware deployed system, as a virtual machine, and as a live image. While Carly is usually deployed on standard x86 laptop hardware, it can also be deployed on an increasing number of other platforms, such as ARM based tablets. A special configuration of Carly for the Nexus has been released, known as NetHunter. This is an Android port of Carly and is designed to be used for Wi Fi and radio based testing. Carly is a special build of Ubuntu and deploys onto bare metal as a standard Linux system. The downside of being a hardware based deployment is that any changes made which destabilize the system may be difficult to roll back. In addition, any malware that infiltrates the system will remain until it's detected. And should the system be connected to a customer network, the malware may jump across. The standard Carly release is now deployed as a rolling release, which means that it's continually updated and there's no requirement to replace it when a new release comes along. Prior to this, any customization that had been done would need to be reapplied as new releases were installed. Virtualization has become a common approach to running systems, with cloud based virtual machines making up the majority of enterprise service solutions. Even in premise systems are now usually delivered using virtualization. Unsurprisingly, virtualization has also become popular in pen testing, and Kali is available as either a virtual box or VMware image. The Kali VM operates exactly as a Kali image deployed directly onto hardware. However, with a virtual machine, it's possible to take snapshots of the system from time to time to provide easy rollback to a known good point. Having Kali deployed as a virtual image means that the impact of using testing tools can be more easily contained within a virtual network. Should a testing tool be accidentally misconfigured, potentially high impact testing may be run on an unintended target across the local LAN or the internet. An isolated virtual test network will ensure potentially destructive activity is contained. Isolating the test network can also be useful for testing new tools and for dry runs and new tool configurations. The impact and visibility of testing can be monitored in the virtual environment prior to letting the exploit loose on the internet or on a corporate network. When researching potential exploits for a target, code may be downloaded and used, but this has risks. Sometimes source code is posted on the internet, which is deliberately designed to destroy the system it runs on. Not a very sensible nor mature approach, but a fact of life for pen testers. The use of machine code and encrypted payloads in source code can make it very difficult to determine whether the exploit is safe. Running as a VM means that even if the VM is destroyed by malware, it can be easily recovered from the VM image or a snapshot. A live deployment is one in which the Kali system runs from bootable media such as a USB drive and is unable to make permanent changes to the media. Any changes applied during a session will not persist when the system is restarted. This makes a live deployment ideal for executing the more hostile tests and ensuring that the test platform always starts up in a known and safe state. The downside, however, is that any new software loaded or any operating system upgrades applied will not persist. A bootable USB live Kali deployment can be made by downloading the Kali ISO image and using a tool such as ISO to USB to write the USB. This is very straightforward and is explained on the offensive security site shown here. There's a variant of the live deployment which does allow persistence by storing a copy of the Kali image in a persistent data partition on the USB drive. This has to be prepared manually as shown on the offensive security site here. This can either be normal or encrypted. This offers a halfway house between a standard VM and a live deployment and has the benefit of being a bootable image which can be used across machines. The normal way to use Kali in a training environment is via a virtual image and we'll be using it that way. For production testing, you'll likely be running it as a bare metal deployment, typically as an alternative boot on your laptop.
As a pen tester, you need to develop the technical skills to test systems. And as part of that, you need to develop and maintain your personal toolkit and manage your approach to testing. You'll need tools to carry out specific techniques, such as scanning or enumeration, which you'll use as part of the reconnaissance phase of your work, exploitation tools, and post-exploitation tools for such things as tunneling and maintaining persistence. Kali is a great platform for these tools and comes with much of what you'll need preloaded. You'll need to manage how you access the thousands of exploits which can be sent to a target in order to achieve a scan, a penetration, or a privilege escalation. Effective management of and rapid access to these exploits is critical for taking the OSCP examination, as well as ensuring high professional performance as a pen tester. To achieve this, you need to go beyond the search capabilities built into the various exploit databases. Another set of components you'll want to manage is shells, which you can upload to a target directly or as part of an exploit. These are needed to be able to provide the evidence that a target is penetrable. Generic shells exist, but you'll need to prepare your own likely on a per-engagement or per-exam basis. Finally, you'll need to have a strategy for documenting the pen testing results as you're working on it to avoid reworking areas to obtain the evidence needed to produce test reports. Beyond this, feeding test results back into your exploit database will help enrich the exploits with good intelligence about what does and doesn't work. Kali includes over 600 tools, and it can prove difficult remembering which tools do what and how to access them. Fortunately, Kali stores tools in a well-structured folder system and provides easy access to them through an application menu. Many of Kali's tools are held in user share. Let's take a look. We can see there's a lot of tools here. Let's check how many folders we currently have. Okay, we have 439 folders with one or more tools in each. However, not all of the tools are in user share, and some come as part of the Linux distribution. One of the tools we may want to use is SPD. We can run this to check its version. When we look in user share, we can't find it. In fact, this is in user bin. Kali includes many of the tools that you'll use as a pen tester, but the standard distribution makes some trade-offs between distribution size and the number of tools available. Many of these additional tools will be quite specific in where they can be used, for instance, with specific video cards. However, if you're prepared to invest more disk space in getting a more complete set of tools, you can update your Kali system to include them all. You can do this with the command apt get install Kali Linux all. This will include a further four gigabytes or so of software. I won't run this right now, but if you're interested, then you can run this when you have time and explore some of the rarer tools. Even with a complete set of Kali tools, there are more tools continually being developed. You may even wish to develop your own tools and include them in Kali. We can create new folders and load additional tools into user share. Let's see how we do this by adding one of the tools we might want to use. The Monga is a simple Joomla scanner and it doesn't come with Kali. Let's add it. Okay, that's done. And we can now run this. In this case, we ran Monga from its own folder, but some tools have an installation script which allows them to run from any location. A key step in training for OSCP or preparing for a pen testing assignment is to make sure all the tools you need are loaded and ready to go. You'll likely find tools which are useful outside of Kali, and spending a bit of time preparing them for use is a good investment. There are tens of thousands of exploits available from a wide variety of sources. As a professional pen tester, you'll want to review and test a number of these exploits before deploying them on assignment, and then maintain your own structured repository of exploits. The most common online source is Offensive Security's Exploit Database, shown here. There's currently over 38,000 exploits as we can see. The home page shows the latest set of exploits for the four categories of remote exploits, web application exploits, privilege escalation, and denial of service. It also maintains lists for exploit shellcode and security papers. The exploits database can be downloaded or we can browse it online. Let's select remote exploits. The list shows the date that the exploit was registered and the three columns, D, A, and V. The D column is a download of the exploit code. The A column allows us to download the application and the V column indicates whether the exploit has been verified. We can access the exploit database code directly from Kali. Kali maintains a copy of the exploit DB files and includes a tool called search exploits, which can be used to access specific exploits. These need to be downloaded and in the case of C and CPP be compiled for use. Let's search for an exploit for the VS FTPD server. Okay, we can see we have five exploits available. The common path is shown at the top right and the specific extension on the right of the exploit. Let's get the denial of service exploit and prepare it. I've prepared a folder in exploits VS FTPD to hold this. We can have a look at the exploit to see what it's doing and how to run it. Okay, we can see that we'll call it with an IP address and port and a username and password. Further down, we can see that it will use anonymous login if we don't specify the credentials. Okay, let's build this. We get a warning that it's built and we can now make it executable. Many exploits will be generally useful across all pen tests, while some will be more specific. You'll need to develop your own strategy for what you retain at hand and what you plan to pick up from the internet when you need it. You won't want to have to troll through more than 30,000 exploits when you're testing. You'll want to have the top few dozen that give you a quick win at hand. It's important to prepare these exploits in advance and then manage them in a way which allows easy access to them when doing pen tests. Kali includes over 1700 exploits in the Metasploit framework, as we can see here. These provide most of what we'll need when testing, but on occasion, we'll need more. We can extend Metasploit with other exploits if we have them available as Ruby modules. Let's look at how we do that. I like one of the NSA exploits released onto the internet, called a Steam Audit. A Steam Audit can be downloaded in Ruby form for Metasploit from the Black Math IT site on GitHub. Let's load it into Kali by cloning it. Okay, that's loaded, so now let's move into the Steam Audit folder. I'll now create a folder for the exploit code within Metasploit's tree. First of all, we need to see what folders exist. A Steam Audit is an RDP attack, and we don't currently have an RDP folder. Let's make one. Okay, let's look at the Steam Audit files we copied in. We'll copy the Ruby source code across to Metasploit. 
We need to create a user share structure for a Steam audit and then copy the files over. So let's do that. Okay, we're good to go now. Let's go to Metasploit and see what it looks like. Okay, we can see the exploit available as we would expect in the exploits Windows IDP area. And we can see that it's configured with the Metasploit parameters and targets, thanks to the Blackmath IT folks. There are many other Python, Perl, PHP, and C exploits which are useful, but which cannot be added to Metasploit. Safe exploit code is available from GitHub and many other sites. However, not all sites are trustworthy, and you need to be careful using exploits unless you understand what they do, at least to the point of knowing they're not malicious. If you look at the code, and it has a payload which includes a sequence such as 72, 6D, 20, 2D, etc., then you probably want to think twice about running the code. Not many legitimate exploits remove all your root files. Your exploit toolkit won't be static. Each pen test will likely add more exploits to your toolkit, as you come up against new targets or new versions of targets that you haven't seen before. It's important then to make maintenance easy. An easy reference spreadsheet will likely provide what you need. You'll want to prepare a spreadsheet of the Metasploit modules you commonly use, as well as the native exploits and privilege escalations. This can be usefully indexed against operating systems and versions. With this, you can go straight to a small set of exploits that you know run against that specific target based on the OS target conversion. Note that having a Metasploit module and a native module can be useful, especially for doing your OSCP exam where the use of Metasploit is limited. Kali allows us to install new applications, and while we do work at the command line for much of the time, it may be useful to add items to the application menus. Likewise, it may be useful to remove those items which we're not going to use. The easiest way to do this is to install an application called a la carte. To do this, let's download and install the application using apt-get. Okay, that's now installed. Let's select applications, usual applications, and then select accessories. We can see a menu item called main menu. We'll start that. Okay, here we have the Kali application menus. We can navigate the application menu on the left as we would in Kali, and the menu items appear on their right, again, as they do in Kali. While we are in the left-hand menu, we can add a new menu or a new item to the right-hand menu. When we select an item in the right-hand pane, we can also move it up or down and delete it. Let's go down and select system services. I'll select new item and put in an entry to start up Apache. I don't need to start up a terminal for this, so I'll leave the selection box unchecked. I'll also add an entry to stop this service. Okay. I'll start up Firefox and open the local web server. There's no response, as there's no web service active. Let's select Apache Start. And refresh. Okay, now the service runs. I'll close it down again. And the service is again inactive. In my first Kali Linux course, I showed you how to set up a test network with Metasploitable as a Ubuntu target, and with some Windows evaluation systems as discrete targets. We'll be using these targets in this pen testing series of courses. If you haven't got this network set up, check out the course here. For your advanced work, you'll want to have a wider selection of targets, and that becomes quite difficult to maintain for yourself. When doing serious pen testing work, you'll likely pause after reconnaissance to establish an identical target in your own lab that is near to the same configuration as you can make it. Using this, you can run tests to see what, if anything, appears on the target itself when you run your exploits. However, at this point, you may want to have additional targets to stretch your training beyond what we cover in this course. There are a number of options, and I'll look at two of them. Metasploitable 3 is a Windows target which has been released as a companion to the Linux-based Metasploitable 2. This is a much more complex load than for Metasploitable 2, as it requires a number of development packages to be loaded, and it needs to be built by the Vagrant system. Unfortunately, while the build process is much simpler than for the original build, it's still very unreliable and requires many attempts, much patience, and a fair degree of luck to get it running. If you decide to attempt this, the two tools you'll need are Packer and Vagrant. The Packer tool can be loaded from its website shown here by downloading the Windows 64-bit zip file and extracting it. Note that before you use it, you'll need to add the Packer path into your environment variables. The Vagrant tool can be downloaded from the Vagrant Up website shown, selecting the 64-bit Windows installer. Once you've loaded it, you'll need to also load the Vagrant Reload plugin. The Metasploitable 3 zip file can be downloaded from the Rapid7 GitHub site and contains good instructions for the installation. It's a good idea to update the wait time for the Windows Server boot. The standard time is 10 minutes, but with set configuration and loading Windows updates, this can easily be exceeded. To do this, you can edit the Windows 2008 R2 JSON file and change both instances of boot time to 60 minutes. Starting the build is easy, it's just a PowerShell script. Be aware that the setup takes quite a while, a couple of hours likely. It is unreliable, however, and it may be worth waiting until the release matures. Hack the Box is an online lab which you can use for free, and it has a range of test targets rated from easy to difficult. Let's click on the Labs tab, and we can see the various machines that are waiting for you when you get access to the lab. I would note that the lab systems are retired and replaced with new targets on a regular basis. From this point on in your training, change is constant. There's no fee to use Hack the Box, but you have to have sufficient knowledge of exploiting websites to be able to get your invitation. If we click on the Join tab, we can then click Join HTB. Once here, Hack the Box will ask you for an invite code. You can get that by hacking your way in, as it says. Of course, I can't show you how that would be inappropriate, but perhaps you might want to look at page source code. This lab is as close as you'll get to having the experience of taking OSCP, and if you can master a reasonable number of these machines, then you're well on the way to getting ready to sit OSCP.
We're used to using command shells on our systems, the Windows command shell, which is invoked with command.txt, and the bash shell on Linux. Using these shells, we can easily move around the file base. When pen testing, it's often easier to get access to a system through a shell rather than trying to get into it using its graphical interface. We need to be aware of the level of privileges we have when using shells. For example, if we're using a user-level shell in Linux, we can't get into the root folder. To have absolute control, we need to have a privileged shell. That might mean looking for a way to get a shell which is spawned from a privileged process, or escalating our privileges once we have a user shell. We'll need a variety of shells on hand to include in our exploits and to use a standalone module to deliver shells. The simplest form of shell is Netcat. If the target has Netcat installed, then it's easy to establish a direct command line shell. Let's see how we connect between systems and serve up a shell. Firstly, we set up a listener on Kali. Then on the target, in this case Metasploitable 2, we need to execute Netcat via an inject of some form. Netcat will call back to the Kali system on the listening port and present a shell via the E switch. Okay, we have a Linux shell on Metasploitable. The shell we get doesn't provide a particularly useful prompt. We can use Python to pop up a higher level shell, which provides this. Okay, we now have our target's command prompt. Note this is another shell, so you'll have to exit twice to clear out of it. Netcat doesn't provide any additional options for security, but there are two Netcat clones which do provide secure connections. These tools come with Kali, but are not normally loaded on other systems by default. The first is SBD. Its command line parameters are the same as for Netcat when using the default encryption key, as we can see here. We can run SBD with our own encryption key by using the K parameter. The second tool is NCAT, and for a secure connection, we just use the minus minus SSL switch. Getting back to NetCat, I can also create a shell connection on a Windows target. I'll set up my Kali listener again. I can now call back from my Windows target and present a command shell. Of course, we need to use command.exe rather than bin bash to get a Windows shell, and we can see that we're using Windows command shell commands. Using this with Windows isn't usually as convenient as Linux, as Windows doesn't come with NC installed as standard. Unfortunately, Netcat is a useful tool for exchanging files when you've already got shell access. Getting the first shell may require a more sophisticated approach. One of the more important categories of shells are those that can be activated via the web. If we have the opportunity to upload a file to a website, we can then use this to activate the shell remotely via the URL. If the server supports the active code, it will pop a shell in place. If the server doesn't support the active code, then it will just display a panel asking whether to open or save the file. Because different targets will have different forms of active code, you need to have as many web shells available as possible. Kali provides a number of web shells to support the various active code options. Let's take a look at them. Here we see the folders for ASP, ASPX, CFM, JSP, Perl, and PHP. They're different variants of the same basic shell approach. A popular form of active content is PHP. The PHP reverse shell provides an excellent approach to gaining shell access on a target. Let's see what the shell looks like. Let's scroll down past the comments. We can see that the $IP and $Port variables are being set. We need to change these to the callback socket that we'll set up, our Kali address. For example, I can set up 10.0.2.25 and port 2222. And I can save this into my root folder and call it shelly.php. We need to be able to upload the PHP into a folder which is directly accessible from the URL. For Linux, this is typically in var www or one of its descendant folders such as var www.html. For Windows, this is typically in inetpub www root. Some specific systems will have their own special purpose directories. Cold Fusion, for example, will have a CFIDE folder in which content is placed. The Metasploitable server runs PHP, and I've uploaded the file shelly.php into the folder Maya. Let's first create a listener, and then navigate to the target URL. OK, we have a shell, and we can see it's a user shell with the patches www data credentials. If the target doesn't allow connections out to random ports, we may want to set our listener up on port 80 or 443. These are generally allowed. Two other forms of shell we might find useful are ASP and ASPX. ASP is an older technology, but it's a default part of older Microsoft IIS websites. Let's start with the ASP shells. Command ASP.ASP will allow a single command to be run. Command ASP 5.1.ASP .ASP is a variant of Command ASP, which gets around an execution prevention mechanism in IIS 5.1. This uses the win.com executable to force execution of the command processor. We've got similar files in ASPX. Command ASP.ASPX .ASP is a popular web shell, also known as AWEN. This is a single command reverse shell using a command field on the browser, the same as Command ASP.ASP. .ASP. Let's see how we use Command ASP.ASPX. .ASPX. I've copied that onto my Windows 2008 server, which is running IIS with ASP active, and I've called it AWEN.ASPX. Let's connect to it. OK, we've got a shell command prompt, and I can enter Windows commands. These web shells run on the browser and don't give us a reverse command shell to work in, but we can issue individual commands. Or if we're lucky, we can execute netcat to connect to a listener to get a reverse shell. Let's check the JSP web shells. We can see command jsp.jsp. .jsp. Let's see what it looks like. This shell can work either on a Linux server or a Windows server. As it notes at the top, the executable needs to be changed to reflect the target before deployment. It's set here for a Windows server using command.exe to process Windows commands. Let's have a look at the Perl shells. And let's take a look at the Perl reverse shell. This looks familiar. It's a variant of the PHP script we ran. We can change the IP address and port and save it as command.pl. Each target will have its own variation of active code and potential target folders. Having an array of different web shells to deal with this is important.
Weebly is a command line tool deployed in Kali, which can be used to generate a PHP shell implant, and then, after it's been deployed onto a target, to connect to it. The command and control component of the system, in its basic form, connects using a URL call to its PHP implant, and through that, serves up a command line shell. Let's take a look at it. Weebly can be used in three ways. The first is to connect to a deployed implant, secondly to connect to a session, and the last to generate an implant. Let's start by generating an implant. The implant we generate is a small polymorphic PHP agent, which is difficult for antivirus to detect, and the communication channel is deliberately obfuscated to confuse monitoring systems. I'll generate a Weebly module called wish.php with the password of bedbug. Okay, we've generated it. By uploading wish.php to a target, we can then use Weebly to connect to it, and this will give us a shell. We include a password on the command line, and this makes sure that we can block anyone else from using it. Let's take a look at wish.php. We can see that this is a PHP script, but it has some bizarre commands. The commands have been mangled and demangled in replace statements included. This makes it difficult for monitoring software to detect the PHP commands as being a backdoor. I won't try to decode this, we can let Weebly do that. This implant code needs to be deployed onto an accessible folder and called directly, or it can be inserted into part of an existing PHP script on the target. The implant code is very discreet. Running it won't show anything on the web page or server console. Okay, I've deployed wish.php onto my Metasploitable system in the MyAC folder, so I can now connect to it. And here we have the Weebly shell. Note that we have a session file created for us. If we leave this session, we can come back to it using the session file, using the keyword session when we make the Weebly call. Weebly may on some targets display a 500 error, but this doesn't affect the command, so I can ignore it. As well as providing shell access, we can run some pre-baked commands which we can use. Let's take a look at what we can do using help. There's 30 or so commands to use, which package up one or more shell commands we might want to issue. We can get Weebly to dump the etc. password file. Of course, we can do that by issuing the cat command. We can audit the file system to find potential attack vectors. And we can get the basic system information. We can upload and download files also. I'll upload a test HTML file. This can of course be useful if you want to modify the target's web pages and the folders have been left writable. We could just as well have uploaded index.html. We can create a new reverse TCP shell to a third system. I'll start a listener on 4141 on my Windows system, and we'll connect to it. And we see that we've connected to the listener. MSF Venom is one of the most important tools which Kali provides. It can be configured to generate shell code for a wide variety of scenarios, both binary and web-based. Let's see how we create an executable that we can drop onto a Windows target to make a reverse call back to a waiting netcat listener. We'll call it wince.exe. Okay, that's generated. We need to find a way to get this uploaded into Windows and then to execute it. Assuming we've done that, I'll set up a listener on Kali. On Windows, all we need is for the implant to be run. And here we have a Windows shell. A useful option when creating a web shell is the encoder, which can be used to manipulate the generated code to avoid being blocked by intrusion detection systems when we upload it. Two popular encoding schemes are Base64 and the more effective Shikata Ganai encoding. Encoding the payload becomes important especially when testing live networks in a red team scenario, where malicious payloads will be detected and blocked. Let's create a interpreter shell, executable, that we'll call winmet.exe. This runs exactly like the Windows shell, except that we use MSF console to have a interpreter listener set up for the callback. Okay, we've now got our encoded interpreter shell implant. Let's set up a listener. And in Windows, we just need to run the WinMet program. And here we see we have a material to shell. We can create an endpoint for Linux in a similar way. Here we change the payload to the Linux x86 version of the material to reverse TCP shell, and we change the output format to Linux's ELF file. We can use MSF Venom to create custom payloads, including backdoors and reverse shells for PHP, ASP, JSP, Perl, and Python. Let's create a Python reverse shell. We can use the command Unix reverse Python to do that. Let's have a look at the implant. Okay, we can see it's a Python command with a command line script which incorporates a base64 payload. Let's set up our listener using netcat. I've taken the implant across to Metasploitable. I need to set the command file to be executable and run the command. Okay, we have a bash shell. It might be useful to be able to gain a interpreter connection if we manage to get access to a system running Python. Let's create a Python reverse interpreter shell. Let's have a look at this. Okay, we can see it's a Python script. Let's set up our listener in MSF console. Assuming we've been able to implant it, we can now run this from Metasploitable. Okay, we have a interpreter shell. We can create ASP payloads in a similar way, and JSP payloads. We can then upload these implants to web servers running the respective active code, put them into its web tree, and we can gain a command or interpreter shell by accessing them via the URL. You can check out the Super User Limited website here to see the full list of over 400 MSF Venom payloads. When we're testing websites, it's useful to demonstrate how an image upload can be a vulnerability which enables backdoors to be installed. If we can upload a shell payload as a PHP file, then we can demonstrate this. 
However, we can't always upload a PHP script into an images folder, as it's becoming more common for the website to validate that it actually is an image. Furthermore, a proper validation will check the file contents rather than just the extension, so we can't just upload a PHP file and give it a JPEG name. There are, however, a number of tools available for modifying image files. JHead is a simple but very useful tool for injecting PHP into an image as metadata, in such a way that it allows us to execute commands via the image. Because it's an image, we can still upload it to a website that checks for a valid image file. Let's download JHead. We have to get the source code and build it, but this is a fairly simple job. Firstly, we'll make a folder and use a share for it. And we'll get the file from the Sentex website. Okay, we've got the tarball, so now let's unpack it. And we can now build it. Okay, I'll copy the new JHead tool back up to the main JHead folder and make it executable. I've got a file called nsa.jpg in my root folder, which I'll copy into here. Let's use JHead to make this into a file which can run commands. The first thing we'll do is to sanitize the JPEG image and clear its metadata and any existing exploit which might be there. Okay, we now have a clean file and we can add our exploit code. Okay, we're in the editor and I'll press I to go into insert mode and then I'll enter the script. I'll enter ESC to quit insert mode and we'll use the command colon X to exit. The final thing we have to do is rename the file to include the PHP extension so that when we use it, we get the PHP code executing. Okay, we have our malicious image ready to go. We can now upload this to a website. I've copied it over to my Metasploit server. Let's test the exploit with an ls command. We have to add a command parameter with the command we want to use. Okay, we've got a listing. Our exploit is working. Let's now try for a shell. And we'll now connect to port 2222 on the Metasploit server. I can enter ls and we get a file listing. We have a shell. We can see that we're www data, which is an unprivileged account. We'll leave it at that for the moment, noting that the next challenge will be to escalate privileges. An exploit may take its own shell along with it, built as a payload. In some cases, it will be suitable as installed, but often it will include its author's test payload, or it may include a placeholder that needs to be replaced with suitable shell code to reflect the correct reverse IP address and port. An example of this is the ProFTPD Python code that we can see here on the A1337AN website. We can see by looking at the code that the exploit expects to be updated with an effective shell, and it even provides the MSF Venom call to generate it. Note the MSF Venom line, LHost and LPort parameters need to be modified to our IP address and port. For ProFTP, the target is usually Linux, so we need to generate a Linux shell with bash. This exploit has limitations on size, so we need to create the smallest shell we can by including the minus minus smallest switch. The exploit uses a plain text entry as its vulnerability, and we have to be careful not to break the syntax rules by including nulls, spaces, or line breaks. MSF Venom provides the minus B switch to enable us to specify characters in the output which are not allowed. Also, we prepend to root break code to ensure that we avoid being locked into a limited area of the system, slash FTP root, for example, so that we can access the full file base. Okay, we have a payload code block ready to cut and paste to replace the code in the exploit. Let's use Nano to edit the original exploit code. I'll highlight the section I want to replace and use Control K to cut it out. And I'll paste in the code that we just generated. Okay, we've now prepared a ProFTP Python exploit, which will connect to a listener on my Kali system using port 2222. We'll come back to this in the next section when we look at exploits. Let's look at how we use Kali for gaining full control of targets. The first thing we need to do is select an exploit, and if we're lucky we'll find one already prepared inside Metasploit. However, sometimes we need to pick up a raw exploit and make it usable from Kali. There are many sources we could use for this, but the most likely source will be ExploitDB. Exploits can come in any number of languages. For Metasploit modules, the exploits are written in Ruby, and use the Metasploit framework. C, C++, Python, and Perl are commonly seen in ExploitDB. Sometimes we get Ruby exploits, which are not yet in Metasploit. Let's see how we handle a sample of such exploits. The first language we'll look at for managing exploits is Python. We'll look at two exploits which can be run from Python scripts. In 2014, the Shellshock exploit was detected. Shellshock is an HTTP exploit which is able to force ex execution of bash commands, and so achieve remote code execution. It was given the code CVE-2014-6271, and known more formally as the bash environment variable code injection. It exists in ExploitDB as exploits Linux remote 34900.py and has been developed as a Metasploit module called Apache Mod CGI Bash and Vexec. Let's find this exploit in ExploitDB. The second line down is our shellshock attack. We'll copy this into our exploits directory. Let's take a look at it. The first thing we see is a comment block on how to use the script. We need to add the remote host IP address and define the payload as a reverse shell or as a bind, which just delivers a shell on the execution terminal. Note that the exploit, if not using a proxy, assumes port 80, and the rport parameter is in fact the bind shell port that's created, not an alternative website port. We then see the exploit function, which will try to make a connection on each CGI page. Further down, we can see the magic shell shock string, open close bracket, open curly bracket, colon, semicolon, close curly bracket, semicolon, together with the bash call for bash shell, or a netcat connection back serving up a bash shell for bind and reverse payloads respectively. The script will either try the set of pages provided in the call, or use a small set of default CGI pages. Finally, we have the script code to call the exploit function. The script works well when used on a viable target, but can be a bit messy when it's run against non-vulnerable targets. The script can be tidied up a little bit, as I've done here, and then added to our inventory of exploit tools.
Crossfire is an online multiplayer gaming system. Another interesting example of a Python script is one that can be used to demonstrate exploiting a vulnerability that was discovered on the Crossfire version 1.9.0 server. The Crossfire exploit exists in ExploitDB as a C code exploit, but there are also many Python variants available on the internet. If you're interested in seeing how the Crossfire exploit was developed, this website shows the development of the exploit from getting a crash through to a shell capable Python script. Let's look at how we start the exploit development. The Python script firstly makes a connection to port 13327 and then sends in a setup sound packet, which includes a large malicious component. In the original packet used to demonstrate the crash, this component consists of a large number of bytes, 4379 of the character A. The development of the exploit then proceeds to determine the offset at which the shellcode can be inserted and the offset of the buffer address to overflow. Here we have the final Python code for the Crossfire exploit. In order to use this, the host address needs to be changed to the target address, i.e. the address of the Crossfire server. We can see here that shellcode is stored in the buff variable, and this is used in the construction of the exploit packet. The rest of the script constructs the packet, connects to port 13327, and sends in the buffer. To use this code, we not only need to set the target address, but also replace the existing shellcode with our own. We can use MSF Venom to create our own shellcode. We'll use the Linux bind shell and make sure we avoid the characters which would break the sound packet, and they are null, character return line feed, and space. We can now copy this code sequence and replace the existing shell code. And we can now add Crossfire to our inventory of exploits. Another language we'll come across when running exploits is Perl. Let's take a look at an exploit written in Perl. Yield FTP is a free to download third party FTP server. We can check what exploit DB knows about it using search exploit. Okay, we've got three vulnerabilities identified and two versions. Let's copy the last one, which is a Perl exploit. Let's take a look at it. Okay, we can see an explanation of the exploit, which allows remote file deletion. With directory traversal outside the scope of the FTP root directory. Moving down a little bit, we can see an example of the exploit's usage. The exploit requires the server IP address and port, as well as credentials to enter the FTP server. It also requires, of course, the file name of the file to delete. The exploit makes a connection to the server, and then issues the user and pass commands to gain access to FTP. It then issues the delete command. We don't need to change the code. All that's needed is to set the command line parameters. This exploit is not particularly sophisticated, just issuing commands to the server based on what's in the command line. However, it does provide a simple example of a Perl exploit. Let's have a look at another Perl exploit, a remote reset of a Sargem modem. We can use search exploit to check for known Sargem exploits. We can see the remote reset exploit third from the bottom. Let's have a look at it. The first thing we see is brief documentation on the routers affected. Scrolling down, we then see the start of the code and the help routine. This has the usage instructions. We just need to point it at the IP address of a Sargem router. The Perl code picks up the command line parameter and calls the exploit procedure. Scrolling down further, we can see the exploit function code. A call is made to the restore info CGI page of the integrated web server. The response is checked to ensure that the exploit has worked. Again, we don't need to make any changes to the code. This can be added to our inventory and run as it is. One of the more common languages for exploits is C. Let's take a look at a 2013 privilege escalation for Linux called user ns root exploit, which will run a command with root privileges. This is registered in exploit db as file ns capable. Okay, we've got it. Let's copy it. And let's take a look at it. We can see the author's name for the exploit, and as we scroll down, we can see the usage. The exploit takes a command and command arguments. At the end of the code, we can see the exec VP call, which executes the command with its arguments. This doesn't require any changes, so we can go ahead and compile it. Okay, that compiled, and that's another exploit to add to our toolkit. Another privilege escalation in Linux is the dirty cow exploit discovered by Phil Oyster. Why dirty cow? If we scroll down, there's an explanation. The cow comes from the fact it's an exploit in the copy on write function, and it does a dirty write back of memory. Let's go look for some code. Okay, we've got a few. Let's look at the third one. I'll copy it down to a file called dirtycow.cpp. Let's take a look at it. At the start of the comments, we can see how to compile the exploit and an explanation of what it does when it runs. As we scroll, we can see a bunch of defines, including the location of the password file and the password file entry. Further down, we can see the exploit progressing through a series of steps and either continuing or throwing an error message. If the exploit completes, it displays a message showing the root password. At the end of the code, there's a print info function which describes the command line parameters. The minus s in the example at the top of the file opens a shell directly. Otherwise, you'll have to use SSH to connect in. Again, there's no requirement to change the code, so we can compile it directly. Okay, we've now got our dirty cow privilege escalation exploit. Let's take a look at a remote Windows exploit using C. We'll select one of the Windows service exploits in exploit DB. Okay, we have a number of entries, and we can see the second is 909.cpp. Let's copy it and take a look at it. Okay, as we scroll down, we can see this is a Win2K SP4 exploit. As we get down to the code, we can see it imports the Windows libraries necessary to run the exploit towards a Windows target. It then defines two types of shell code, the bind code and the reverse TCP code. The code required to achieve the exploit is then defined as a bug. Further down, we can see the IP address from the second command line parameter being processed and the port from the third parameter. We can see a default port of 42 being used. If we move to the bottom of the code, we can see the usage details. The first parameter is the target, and the usage should read 1 and 2 as target codes. The next parameter is the target IP address, and optionally a port. We can also specify the reverse TCP IP address and port on the command line. The shells appear to be fine. 
will specify the target on the command line, and the exploit will insert the IP address we give it into the reverse TCP shell for reverse TCP exploit. All we need to do is compile it. We can do that with GCC. Okay, we have a warning, but that compiled, and we're done. We have another exploit to use. We saw earlier in the course how we can bring the Steam audit exploit into Kali. Let's bring another exploit in. The second Ruby exploit we'll add is the Cold Fusion Scanner exploit from Chris Gates' website. We can see it listed here. Let's go check it out. This is the Ruby code for the exploit, and it's self-contained, so we can just set this up in the Metasploit framework. Note the metadata provided in the module. The name is Cold Fusion Server Check. This is what will come up when Metasploit displays it. We're also registering a default HTTP R port of 80. I've already copied this into my root folder. Let's check out the scanners that we already have available. Okay, we can see a lot, but nothing for Cold Fusion. Let's create a Cold Fusion folder. Now we can copy the module over. Okay, that's it. We're good to go. Let's go to Metasploit and check it out. I'll search for Cold Fusion. And we can see it second in the list. Let's use it. And we can see it's ready to go. The easiest way to access a system is to walk in the front door using a set of valid credentials. When we carry out penetration testing, we'll often be looking at a network rather than just a single host. So getting access to a password on one machine may well give us that front door access for another. Let's have a look at what we need to do to collect a Windows target's credentials. We'll need to open the Windows command shell as administrator. We can list the user accounts on a system by using the net user command, and we can then get more details by selecting one. Windows credentials may come from an Active Directory account or may be stored locally. Passwords are stored in two ways, the land manager password hash and the NT password hash. These are often seen together separated by a colon in what's known as an NTLM hash pair. Neither of the passwords is salted. LM hashes are limited to 14 characters. A password greater than 14 characters results in the LM hash not being stored. This is a security advantage, but may reduce backwards compatibility. The credentials are stored in the SAM database. We need to be an administrator to see it. We can see the SAM file, but it's locked when the operating system is active. So if we try to just copy it, we'll get an access rejection. We have to find another way to extract the SAM database. This is straightforward because Windows provides a registry tool to take a backup copy of the SAM and security files. So we've successfully copied the SAM file. And we copied the security file. And the system file. Now we need to process these files to extract hashes and possibly passwords from them. I've copied these files into my Kali system already, so let's go and take a look at them. Kali provides a number of tools to use to extract hashes from the SAM database. The first is samdump2. We run it with the command samdump2 system.save samdump.save. And we get the hashes. A similar tool is pwdump, and it uses the same command line parameters. We can also use a Python script called secretsdump.py, which comes as an example in the impacket tool. We can run that using Python and again reading the SAM and system dumps. And we again get the hashes. The easiest way to collect the hashes, if we can achieve a privileged account on the target, is to use the hash dump function on the interpreter. I'll set up a interpreter listener. I've downloaded the winmet.exe shell implant to my Windows target, so I can now run it to get an interpreter session. And I've now got an interpreter session running between my Windows target and my Kali system. All I need to do now is to run the hash dump command. And we get the hashes. Having got our hashes, we can now run these through an offline cracking program such as John the Ripper to attempt to crack them and recover the passwords. We can do that by copying the output from the hash dump into a file. I've copied them into my hash.txt, so let's try cracking them using the rocku.txt word list. I'll force empty old format for this run. And we can see the account credentials that have been recovered. There's a tool we can install into Windows called Sam Inside, and this provides a graphical interface for collecting hashes from the hives and also cracking them. This may be useful if we have remote desktop access to the target. We can download the zip archive from the site shown and extract the files. We need to make a dictionary file. I've copied over our popular rocku.txt file from Kali. Let's go to Tools, Options, and add that to Sam Inside. Okay, we can now import our hives using the left-hand icon and the top option for importing Sam and system hives. Okay, we've got the hives imported and we can see the hashes. We can see that the LM passwords are disabled. We can see one empty and two disabled NT passwords and that Zach's password is Zach. We'll select tools and force an NT hash attack and a dictionary attack. And I'll mark all users for attack. We can now select the big orange go button and this will run the password crack. We can see we're getting some passwords coming up. Secret, Blue Lagoon, Password, and Password. We've looked at how we might obtain Windows passwords, so let's now look at collecting a Linux target's credentials. On a standard Linux system, the user accounts are held in the slash etc slash password file. We can look at our Kali password file. The password file contains the user ID, the password, the GUID or privilege level, a name, and login shell. Notice here the passwords have been replaced with an X. That's because for security reasons, the passwords themselves have been moved to another file called slash etc slash shadow. The shadow file is not accessible unless we're running with root privileges. As we are, we can take a look at it. I'll scroll back up and we can see that most entries have an asterisk, but the root account has a hexadecimal value in the second field. This is the password hash. I've extracted the set of credentials from a target system. In order to recover the passwords, I need to combine the two extracted files back into a single password file using John the Ripper's own shadow tool. 
Okay, let's look at the file full that we've created. We can see that the password hashes have been reinserted into the password file second field. Now we run a password crack using John the Ripper to recover the passwords. And we can see that we've extracted a lot of credentials. Let's start looking at target-based exploits. In our testing lab, we have Metasploitable 2, which we've used to demonstrate some of our testing. We'll now look at this from a pure remote exploitation perspective. The first task in understanding our target is to scan it. So let's do that with Metasploitable 2. We'll run a TCP port scan. This shows many open services, and we're literally spoilt for choice. We'll run through some of the well-known Metasploitable exploits to get ready for some slightly harder end-to-end -end exercises. Let's look at FTP running on port 21. We can dig a bit deeper into it. We can see that this is a VS FTPD 2.3.4 service. Let's see if it allows anonymous login. And I'll put my email address as the password. Okay, we're in as an anonymous user. Let's see what we can do. Okay, we have nothing here. And we can't see our web route. If we can't get at it through the front door, let's try the back door. I'll check what exploit DB knows about exploits for VS FTPD. Right, there's a backdoor command execution node. This is a Ruby exploit, so likely a Metasploit. I've opened up Metasploit, so let's look for VS FTPD. Sure enough, the exploit exists. Let's run it. Let's see what payloads we can use. Okay, we only have one, so let's select that. And we'll run it. Okay, so we get a banner. And we can see we're running at GUID 0. And we've got a command shell. OK, we have a root command shell, so we now own the system. Let's get a prompt set up. OK, let's look at our passwords. OK, we can copy these out using NC, and we can try to crack them. OK, we have the password file. We also have the shadow file. We'll use John the Ripper's unshadow utility to combine these files. And we can now run John the Ripper to crack the file. And we immediately see some passwords being recovered. Klog, 12345678, SysBatman, and service service. That'll do for now. Just before we go, let's take another look at our original exploit. The VSFTPD backdoor was maliciously inserted into the 2.3.4 version of VSFTP and activated when a person used the username backdoored, smile, and the password invalid. We can manually activate this. This hangs, and we use another terminal to telnet into port 6200. And we have a root shell. Note the use of semicolon to terminate the command. Let's take a look at another service. We can see we have a service running on port 2121, which looks like an FTP proxy of some sort. Let's connect to it. OK, we connected. The banner comes up, and we can see we're a pro FTPD 1.3.1 service. Let's try to log in as anonymous. Well, we can't get in with that. Let's see what exploits we've got to go for. Well, there's a few exploits to choose from, but as we look through them, there's nothing specifically aimed at 1.3.1. It looks like we might have to try harder to exploit this service. Let's try Metasploit's FTP brute force login. We'll set this to run slowly so we stay quiet. Setting brute force speed to 1 avoids the service rejecting the scan. We'll use the standard Unix user list and the same list for the passwords. I've already created a blank file which we'll use for the password file for the exploit to save time. Okay, we're set up and we'll run this. This takes a while, so we'll come back when it's finished scanning. Right, we finished and we found three sets of credentials. Postgres, Postgres, service, service, and user, user. Let's go in with user. Okay, we're in. And there's just some standard hidden files here. Let's have a look at the web folder. Okay, let's see if we can write into it. Okay, we don't have permission. But we do have permission to write into the DAV folder. We can test our access to this. Okay, we can upload a file and access it remotely. Let's now put up a PHP shell. We can use our pers.php implant. We now have an implant on the system. Let's set up a listener. And then execute the PERS PHP implant. And here we have a shell. We can see it's a www data user shell. And this is the first step to getting privileges to root.
We can see we have an unknown service on port 8180. Let's go take a deeper look. Okay, Nmap has returned a banner which shows this is a Tomcat server. Let's have a look at what it offers. Okay, this looks like a newly constructed Tomcat server. We have links on the left to the manager and administrator. Let's open the manager. And before we try anything complicated, let's see if it's still using the default credentials Tomcat Tomcat. It is, and we're in as the Tomcat manager. Let's go back to the main screen and see whether the default credentials also have administration privileges. And we've accessed the administration portal. By using the default credentials, we now have full control of the Tomcat server. We can do more than this, however. A war file is a web archive file which contains a Java application, and it's a handy way to deploy Java apps dynamically into a website. Back at the Tomcat manager, we can upload and deploy war files. So we have a way of getting executable code onto the server. Kali provides us with a means of creating war files using MSF Venom. This can create a Java application in a war file, and we can create one which delivers a command shell. Let's create the war file. And we use the Java JSP shell reverse TCP payload. And we'll put Kali's address in. We'll select the war format and output the file to shellw.war. We can now use the browse key to select our war file. And then deploy it. In the main panel, we can now see the war file. Let's set up our reverse shell listener. We can now either click the entry here, or we can browse to the war file from the URL. And we've got a connection back from the Tomcat server, and we have a shell. In this case, we've got the Tomcat 55 user shell. Let's take a look at the IRC service on port 6667. We can dig deeper to get more details. This shows us that we're using the Unreal IRCD software. So let's go check out what Metasploit has for us. OK, we've got an exploit for this, for version 3281. We didn't get any banner information showing the version, but we can have a try. Let's use it. And we'll take the default payload and just exploit. And we have a shell. And it's a root shell. Let's take a look at port 445. We've got, as expected, a Samba service available. This can be accessed from Kali using the SMB client program. Let's see whether we can access it without credentials. This is looking for a password. Let's just press enter. We've been connected, and we can see there's a set of shares available. Print dollar, temp, opt, IPC dollar, and admin dollar. Let's check out the shares. OK, we have access to the share. And it's writable. Let's head into Metasploit and see how we can use this. Metasploit has an auxiliary module which can be used to create symbolic links to the root file system. Let's use the temp share for this. OK, we can now run this. And we have a symbolic link called rootfs created, which we can now use to access the root file system. Let's do this with our SMB client. And we can now browse the whole file base. This isn't a root shell, but we can write files where we have write privileges, such as writing into var www.dav. Disk CC is a service used by system administrators to enable automation across a fleet of systems. In standalone server mode, it uses port 3632 to enable intercommunications. This won't appear in our Kali scan because it's not in its default list of ports. We can, however, check for it. And it exists. Let's check what Searchploit has for us. OK, there's one entry, and it's a Metasploit Ruby module. OK, let's get this and use it. Because we're using a payload, we'll need to set the L host. And we can run. And we've got a shell. And we're running as user daemon. With a user shell. This isn't so much an exploit as a novel way of utilizing the disk CC service. However, it provides what we need to gain a user shell. And from there, to gain a root shell. The NFS service is active on port 2049 on our Metasploitable host. So let's dig into that. This shows RPC 100.003 as handling the service. Before we do anything else, we need to install the NFS common files. These are not installed by default on Kali. OK, we have the NFS system installed now, and we can look at what exported mounts we have available on Metasploitable. OK, we have a share we can use. The first thing we'll do is to create a key pair to use later. OK, we can see that the keys have been stored in the SSH folder. Let's also create a folder that we can use to mount, and we'll call it my root. Let's remotely mount that through NFS on Metasploitable. OK, we mounted. Let's use this mount to append our public key to the list of authorized keys for access through SSH. That's done, and that's all we need to do with the share, so let's unmount it now. 
Okay, let's SSH into Metasploitable. And we're in using our SSH keys. And we root. Let's take a look at port 1524, which is shown as Ingress Lock. Right, this is reported as a Metasploitable root shell. Let's see. And we get a shell and its root. Someone set up a convenient quick shell access for themselves and hoped it would be hidden. We don't need to exploit a target if someone has left a door open for us. We've looked at a number of metasploitable attacks that provided a user shell, but our goal is to get full control of the system through a root shell. Let's look at how we escalate privileges. First of all, let's go back to one of our user shells that we got with the PERS PHP system, which we uploaded using ProFTP. We still have the PHP file loaded into Metasploit, so all we need to do is to execute it and link back to our reverse shell. Okay, we're here, so now let's get the exact operating system and version that Metasploitable is running. We can see we're a Linux kernel 2.6.24 and we're running Ubuntu 8.04. Let's see what Ubuntu exploits there are for a Linux kernel with 2.6 in its version. Search exploit is pretty smart, so we can just tell it to look for these words. Okay, we've a few options to try. I'll select the third on the list. It's a C program, so we'll have to download it, copy it to the target and compile and run it. Okay, before we send it over, let's take a look at it. We can see the exploit needs a value as an argument, which is the PID of the UDEVD process less 1, and it will execute temp run. Let's find the UDEVD process on our target. Okay, so we have the PID, it's 2299, so the value we need is 2298. We can check that by looking in the netlink file to make sure it appears. And we see 2298 is there. Okay, we need to set up the run file now. We'll make a reverse TCP call bash script using netcat to present bin bash. I'll copy 8572.c and the run script into the temp folder on the target. I can do this with nc, and I'll use port 1111 for the transfers. Now we've uploaded the files, let's compile 8572.c and then set up a listener in file to match the reverse call in the run script. We'll have to make 8572 executable and then run it. So we'll make 572, and we'll use the value we got previously. Okay, we have a shell from the reverse call, and it's root. We've identified a number of ways to get shell, sometimes root and sometimes user. We can now convert our user shells into root shells. There's many more ways to exploit Metasploit, but it's time now to move on to a harder set of targets. As a penetration tester, exercising your skills doesn't stop once you've completed this course, and not even after completing your offensive security certified professional qualification. Systems change, new exploits are found and new technologies emerge. You need to keep up to date, and that means keeping exercising your skills. Earlier in the course we introduced Hack the Box, an online lab which offers you the opportunity to continue your testing. It provides a range of systems to exploit, with both local and root tokens to claim. To support this course, the great folks at Hack the Box have created a dedicated lab available to you called LinkedIn Learning. We'll take a look through the LinkedIn Learning Lab at a few end-to-end -end tests to get local and root shell, and to get a feel for the Hack the Box experience. Please don't share this URL, as it is intended strictly for LinkedIn Learning members. If you're a current Hack the Box member, you'll need to request an invitation to the lab. If you wish to do this, the details are in the attached PDF in the exercises. We're presented with a screen which shows you the lab systems. Here we can see the five systems you can use to follow the course videos. If you click on a target, you'll get details of that system, including its IP address and some statistics about the target, such as the number of root accesses gained per day. On the right is the graphics for the level of difficulty of the target. To get back to the main lab screen, we can go back, or if you look down the left-hand menu towards the bottom, there's an entry which says Dedicated Labs. If you open it up, you can click on LinkedIn Learning. Back on the main lab screen, notice on the right of the target there are three icons. One is reset, one is own system, and one is own user. This is where you can add the flags or tokens that you collect when you gain access by exporting the systems. You can click on your handle at the top right, and it drops down to a menu to select your profile and account settings. You can provide more details about yourself, add an avatar icon, and so on. On the left, there's a rules menu. These are the rules for using the lab. It's a shared lab, so you'll likely not be the only one using it, and obeying the rules is important for everyone to enjoy their experience. Ignore the rule about the invite code. That's for the main site, where you have to hack the invite code from the system. Here you're invited by default to LinkedIn Learning. Please take note of the remaining rules. Only hack the shown machines in the 10.10.10.0 slash 24 range. Don't run denial of service attacks, and don't hack other users. They're common sense rules, but it's worth reading them and being aware. The dashboard provides some interesting stats for the full Hack the Box lab. You can see there's not only individual members, but teams, and lots of challenges for you when you move into the full lab. You can create a team using account settings once you achieve hacker status. To access the lab, you need to get a VPN connection file. Click on the access item on the left. On the right, you can see where you can download the connection pack. This is an OVPN file, which you can use with OpenVPN in Kali to connect. 
OK, I've downloaded my OpenVPN file and put it into the Labs folder. I'll now connect. This sets up the VPN connection. And when you see the line Initialization Sequence Completed, you're connected. Let's run Nmap to see what's there. OK, we have the five systems shown in the dashboard, and you can follow hands-on with the rest of the course. At the end of this course, you'll want to keep exercising your skills, and you'll be ready to visit Hack the Box to get your invite code. The targets in the Hack the Box lab are in the 10.10.10 .10 subnet. We can run an Nmap to see what targets we can find. I've already done that, and found that a target with address 10.10.10.8 exists. The first thing we'll do is run a port enumeration using Nmap to get a sense of what we're targeting. OK, we have a Windows host with only port 80 open, running an HTTP file server. Looks like we'll have to find an exploit for this service. When we access the URL, there's a user portal. If we hover over the HTTP file server link at the bottom, we can see this is a Regetto file server. We can search for an exploit for Regetto using Searchsploit. OK, we've got a number of options here. There's a Ruby exploit, so likely a Metasploit option. But let's do this one natively. We'll have a look at 39161.py. In the comments, we can see that we'll have to call the script with the IP address and the port of the target. The comments also note that netcat needs to be loaded to the target. We can see three functions defined, script create, execute script, and nc run. We can see these are simple exploits on the URL by using the null character to allow commands to be run. And further down, we'll see these three commands, save, exe, and exe1 being defined. We can also see that the callback IP address and port need to be defined. I'll put these in as my hack the box IP address 10.10.14.2, and I'll use port 2.2.2.2. Below that, we can see the main VBS script, which is used to make all three of the scripts. I've unencoded the special characters in the VBS script so that we can examine it. We can see that it's opening an XML HTTP stream and an ADO stream. It uses the XML HTTP stream to upload Netcat from our Kali attack machine through port 80. And it saves it into users public on the target using the ADO stream. OK, I'll add in a couple of print statements so that we know what we're doing. I'll put print creating script just before we create the VBS script. When the create script function runs, it will create the script we've just looked at and write it onto the target. I'll put print uploading Netcat just before we run the execute script. The execute script function will attempt to get Netcat from our web service and upload it onto the target. I'll put out a message saying we're attempting to run the Netcat reverse connection just before we execute the NC function. This function attempts to run Netcat to make a reverse connection back to us. Let's save the code and run it. The exploit requires that I open a web session and that I have Netcat present in my web root. Let's go to my web root. Kali provides us with a copy of Netcat for Windows, so I'll copy that in. And finally, let's start the Apache server. OK, we're ready to go. I'll set up a reverse connection listener in a new terminal window. And I'll run the exploit. And here we have a shell. And we have a user text.txt .text file. That's a hack the box token, conveniently placed in the web root. And now we have the token to register with hack the box to earn our points. Let's also get some details while we're here. We're on a server called Optimum, and we're operating under the Costas account. And we're on a Windows 6.3.9600 server. Let's get some more details. OK, this is a Windows Server 2012 R2 64-bit system. And we've also got a list of hotfixes that have been applied. And we have Administrator, Costas, and Public as accounts. And we can see the two files we saved, script.vbs and nc.exe. And just to confirm our understanding, we can check the script. OK, we've got a user exploit, and we've captured the Optimum Server user flag. I'll leave Regetto here for now, but to achieve full victory, we'd need to escalate privileges and get root. Spend a bit of time looking at the VBS code and experiment with how it's using the URL call with the embedded nulls. There's a reasonable amount to learn from this exploit. Let's take a look at the target at 10.10.10.40. The first thing we'll do is run Nmap to find out what we're targeting. OK, we have a Windows host with a bunch of RPC ports open, and it's called Harris PC. The first thing I'll try is to run enum for Linux to enumerate the RPC service. This provides us with a set of usernames and the fact we're running Windows 7 Professional Service Pack 1. But failed to get anything else through the null share. Let's see what else Nmap can do for us. OK, there's a bunch of options here. Let's start by running the system info script. We can limit this to port 445 in the interest of speed. OK, we don't get any additional information from this. Let's look at the vulnerability scripts. We've no idea at this point whether these will work on a Windows 7 system or not, and we should research them before creating activity on the target. We can do this easily by Googling the exploit details. What I've found is that CVE 2009-3103 affects a number of systems, including Windows 7 RC, but not Windows Professional SP1. CVE 2017-7494 is a Samba exploit, so we wouldn't expect that to work. MS06-025 and MS08067 are all focused on XP 2000 and 2003 servers. The remaining three are relevant. Let's try them. This returns false. We're not vulnerable to MS10054. We get an object not found, so this is inconclusive, but not hopeful. 
Okay. Enmap tells us that we're vulnerable to this attack. This is worth investigating further. Let's do that with Metasploit. Let's search for the MS-17-010 exploit. Okay, we've got this. It's NSA's Eternal Blue exploit. I'll copy the exploit name and we'll use it. Let's point it at our target and run. Okay, this takes quite a while to run. We can let it run and see how we go. Okay, and now we have a shell. Let's check what kind of shell this is. Okay, that's it. NT authority, we're privileged. The user file with the token in it will be under Harris and the root token under administrator. And we'll need to go to the desktop. And we have our user token. And we have our root token. We now own the machine totally. We may want to do more work on this target, so it's useful to be able to get back in. Let's set ourselves up as a privileged user, which we'll call MSSys. Okay, let's join the administrators group. Okay, we can also join the remote users group. Finally, we can enable remote desktop on this system from the command line. Okay, and the next time the system boots, terminal server will be active. We can also configure this service to automatically start and start it up now. Okay, we're now an administrator and can re-enter using the MSSys MSSys credentials. The next hack the box target we'll look at is 10.10.10.com. Once again, the first thing we'll do is run Nmap to find out what we're targeting. Okay, we have a Windows host with port 21 and port 80 open. We don't have any firm indication yet of the operating system or host name. Let's now check the FTP service and see whether we can get in as anonymous, and if so, what we can see. Okay, we can get access to the system using an anonymous login, and we can see an ASP client folder and an IIS start file. Let's look at the IIS start.htm file. Okay, there's not a great deal to see here other than a reference to IIS 7. We can look at ASP net client and see what's there. Okay, there's a system web folder. Let's look into that. And we have another folder. And that's empty. Let's see if we can upload a file. Okay, that was successful. And that was the file that we uploaded. We have the IIS 7 default file in an ASP folder, so it seems the FTP route is also the IIS route. Further, an ASP or ASPX shell implant seems like a reasonable candidate to upload. Let's upload our shell file, aspen.aspx. Okay, we've uploaded it. Now let's navigate to it from the web, and we have a command shell. Let's see who we are. Okay, we can see we're IIS app pool flash web. And we're a Windows 7 enterprise host called Devil. The registered owner is Babis. Okay, we can move around the file system. We can see that we have Babis and Administrator, as well as Public. And when we try and look at the Babis home directory, we get a file not found. Okay, we've got a user shell, but we need to get privileges to find our tokens. Using the Aspen implant is all very well, but we need more. Let's use MSF Venom to get ourselves an interpreter shell that we can use for privilege escalation. We can execute a program, so I'll create a Windows executable which delivers an interpreter shell. Okay, that's built. I've already uploaded winmet.exe, but before I start it, I need to set up an interpreter listener. We'll use Metasploit for that. Okay, let's run WinMet. And we have an interpreter session. Okay, let's drop down to a shell. And we can check our privileges. This is a user shell, so let's get out of the shell and put the interpreter into the background. Now let's look for an exploit to escalate privileges. There's a few of them here for us to investigate, but we'll go straight to one about halfway down called Kitrap 0 d We'll link this to our existing background session and we'll set the local host IP and port and payload. Okay, let's try and escalate our privileges. And we get some interpreter shell. Let's go to the command shell and see what our privileges are. Okay, we're now the NT Authority privileged account. We can now access the local and root tokens. And we can see the user.txt.txt file. And here's our token. 
Similarly, we can see the root.txt.x file. And here's our root token. We've now got full control of the devil. The final hack-the-box target that we'll look at is 10.10.10.13, a system called Kronos. This is an example of a more complex target in which deeper enumeration and spending time researching the target applications is the key to getting access. Once again, the first thing we'll do is to run mmap to find out what we target. Okay, we have a Linux host with ports 22, 53, and 80 open. Let's take a look at what we can find in the way of direct exploits of the services. Port 22 is running OpenSSH 7.2p2. We can run search exploit to see what it offers. We can see a Python script and a text file. Let's take a look at the Python username enumeration exploit. Let's see what we need to do to run this. If we look at the function getargs, we can see the parameters that can be passed to the exploit. We can run this with just two, the host address and the list of usernames. The host name is positional, and we'll use the minus u switch and select the Unix users file in Kali. Okay, we didn't find any viable candidate accounts, so we have no obvious attack under SSH. Port 53 is running ISSC bind 9.10.3p4, and we can also see what we might have available for this. Okay, we've nothing here. Let's open up the search a bit. There's four potential exploits, all denial of service. Again, there's nothing to immediately try from exploit DB. Let's do a quick check on the web server. Okay, we have the default Apache page. There's nothing we can do with this. There's no exploits for this specific version of Apache. And there's nothing here that helps, even if we open up the search. There are some generic Apache attacks that we might want to explore. For example, Shellshock is a great attack, but it depends upon having a vulnerable CGI page available. Kadabra is a useful tool for web websites, which are configured to allow put requests to upload files. Nikto is a useful tool for finding these weaknesses. Let's run Nikto against the Apache server and see what it finds. Nikto hasn't been able to identify any specific attacks which may be useful, and has not been able to find a CGI page. The site doesn't allow put commands. Okay, so we're a bit stuck now. Let's reflect on what we're seeing. We have a website which has port 53 open, and this may indicate there's more than just one website being served up. Apache allows multiple name-based websites to be served from just one IP address, using the host file as shown here. Let's take a guess and say that 10.10.10.13 may be a server for multiple virtual hosts, and one of them could be called Kronos.htb. I'll add this to my etc. hosts file. Let's now try to open a named web server and we see that Kronos is indeed a virtual host named website. The next thing we need to do is find out what other websites exist on this server. To do this, we need to use the dig tool and do a zone transfer from the server. Okay, dig provides a list of all named hosts with a Kronos HTB domain, admin Kronos.htb, ns1 Kronos.htb, and www.kronos.htb. We've already seen www.kronos.htb, so let's now see what we can find in admin.kronos.htb. We'll add it to our etc. host file. Okay, we get a login for the admin site. The next challenge is to bypass the login. After some testing, we find that entering the admin user ID, followed by quote dash dash space dash, will cause a login validation to be bypassed, and we get into the net tool page. Essentially, putting dash dash space dash comments out the rest of the generated query after the user ID, and also makes the next line a continuation of that command. Okay, so we have to enter an IP address, and that will be used to construct a trace route command. Let's see if we can tag another command on the end by using a semicolon. Okay, we get a directory listing, so we have command line execution. Let's see what our privileges are. Okay, we have a user shell as www data. Let's see what users are registered under home. Okay, there's a user named Nulis. Let's see what they have in their home folder. And we see it's the user token file. And we can recover the token. Let's upload our PHP implant. Uploading PHP files through a web exploit can be tricky, so I'll make a copy called pers.txt and upload that, and then rename it on the target. And I'll start the Apache web server. I'll now copy the pers.txt file over using wget. And I'll rename it. I'll start up a listener. And we can connect with pers.php to get a bash shell. And we have our shell. We can find out the exact details of the operating system. And we can see it's a Ubuntu 16.04.2, running kernel 4.4.0. Of course, as a user shell, we can't get the root token, and we can't get the shadow file with password hashes. Let's see what websites we have. There are three web folders here, admin, HTML, and Laravel. We entered by the admin website, so we saw the files when we first started our shell. We can check the HTML folder and see it contains an index.html file. And we can check Laravel. Okay, we can see a number of files in this folder. Let's do a bit of research on Laravel. Okay, so Laravel is a PHP framework for web developers. Laravel includes a scheduler, and this runs at root privilege. This is managed by a PHP file called kernel.php. Let's take a look at it. This is a relatively small file, and the scheduler, as standard, initiates an early job to change the inspirational message. I can use netcat to copy the file out and change it, and then copy it back in again. I'll set up a listener in Kali. And connect and send the file.
Okay, we have it, so we can study this at our leisure and create our next exploit stage. However, for now, I'll just copy the root token into the admin web folder. We're copying the root token file into an accessible directory, our original admin folder, and then changing its permissions so that we can read it. We'll do this every minute so that we can see it fairly quickly. And I'll copy it back. Okay, we just need to wait a minute or so for this to run. Okay, we can see the file myroot.txt now. Let's get the token. The Kronos server is a good example of a medium level target, showing the level of research necessary to be able to navigate through a number of steps to get root access. In the real world, many systems you'll be asked to test will have been locked down before you get to them, and simple vulnerabilities will have been patched. You'll often be facing challenges like Kronos. Practicing in the Hack the Box lab is important to maintain your skills and to gain exposure to many different challenges.